Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am very excited to have a guest who I used to work with quite a bit, who I haven't seen in a very long time, the one and only Eva Lovia, also known now as by her real name, which is Candice. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm really good. It's so good to see you. It's been forever. So long. Thank you for having me on. Of course. So the last time we worked together, uh, you were a contract star at Digital Playground, and I was shooting for Digital Playground quite a bit, as we were kind of saying before we started the good old days. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about like how you got that contract and, and how that was for you, because contract stars are kind of not what they were back in like the 2000s. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of interested to hear what your experience was like. So I was a girl, girl performer for probably I would say like half my career. Um, and then I was in the middle of contemplating the switch to, to hardcore film. Um, I contracted my first scenes to reality Kings. Um, and those were about to expire. So I was trying to figure out like, what's the best way for me to still capitalize on this momentum, right? Because, like, there was still that exclusivity. There was only a handful of scenes out. Um, And then when I was younger, I grew up watching the contract girls. So they were kind of put on this pedestal for me. And that was kind of always what I wanted, the level that I wanted to attain. Um, I feel like I had a very different idea of what a contract girl was and what it ended up being. But uh, there was like a reality contest. It was like it was called DP Star and they took a bunch of girls and we had to go through different challenges. And, you know, each week people would be knocked out and it got really intense, like really, really intense. There were girls crying. People stopped talking to one another. Other girls got blacklisted like it was it was real. Um, and then it ended up being like a live orgy. I think that kind of like ended up winning me the contract. Um, so I was with them for a couple of years after that, but yeah, it was, it was intense. Yes, it was. I wasn't, I didn't work on the one that you won on, but Mm -hmm. I was a judge when you were like the host. Right. And then I produced one, I think, was it the following year or the year before that? I think I produced one the following year. Um, being the judge was really fun because I never like got my hair and makeup done and got to, you know, be in front of a camera. I mean, I remember, uh, Nikki Benz and that comedian whose name is escaping me right now, Jim Florentine, right? Yes. Yes. Um, (laughs) we were the judges and, (laughs) and you're right. It was, it was really intense. And I remember when they asked me to do it, I was like, okay, but I can't be mean to people. Can I be like the Paula Abdul? Because, and, but like all of us wanted to be the Paula Abdul. Nikki was like, I want to be the Paula Abdul. I'm like, no, 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 Nikki, you can be the Simon Cowell. Like you have that, you have that like, um, uh, like take no shit presence. Yeah. And like, I'm like, I want to be Paula Abdul. I don't want to be mean to people. And, but you know, like I had to say, negative things to girls, um, for the show. And I really, really disliked that. It was, it was really hard for me. Um, and yeah, like some girls got really upset. One girl said I ruined her career. Um, it was just like, yeah, after that I was like, I don't, I don't want to like be a judge and say mean things to people. It just, doesn't make me feel good. It kind of put everyone in a weird position too, because after that, competition was over, we still had to work with these people. So you still had to shoot them. I still had to shoot with them, assuming like, you know, that no one's on a no list or whatever, but then what do you do? And then your reputation precedes you because it's not like they can't look at it from the lens of this was entertainment, right? Like they can't be just all bubblegum and unicorns. Like there has to be some kind of drama and like not take it personal. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, Eva's a bitch or Holly, like you said, Holly ruined my career. And it's really not that, right? Like it, it was entertainment. Um, so I feel bad, but like, what do you do in that situation? Yeah. Some girls took it really well. They took the constructive criticism really well. Actually, it was funny. September rain just posted something on Twitter saying, um, you know, I remember when I was on the show and Holly and Nikki 
you told me, um, you know, to like wear stockings to cover my legs and like get bigger boobs and like, look at me now. Like I followed your advice and I'm doing great. So I was like, okay, awesome. I'm, I'm glad that, you know, that you took that constructively and, and, um, but yeah, I, it was, it was tough, but you were amazing as a host. I mean, I find that it's really difficult to like be able to remember the things that you have to say and kind of, um, you know, articulate in a very, uh, as you can tell from the way that I'm not spitting this out properly, but you know what I mean? Like you were so in control and composed and you were able to really smoothly say your lines, do the introductions, do the interviews without, um, stumbling on your words. Um, how, how was that experience for you? Because that really made me think like, wow, she's great in front of the camera, not just as a performer, which you were, but also, you know, as just as a host, like you just had, have a confidence in front of the camera and a, a really, um, great ability to just speak well. Thank you. Um, it wasn't something I knew I was going to just take, take, take on so easily. Um, I always had a really bad memory when I was in school and I think it was because I just wasn't interested. As soon as I started in film, I was like, this is my comfort zone. Like this is where I'm thriving. And I, I don't know, I loved stepping into that Eva persona. And at the time, um, I really wanted to help some other girl, like reach a different level of her career. And that was exciting. It was exciting to see like the generation below us and what they were going to do. And in my mind still, like I had a different idea of what that winning that contract was going to be. Um, so in the moment, like it was all the best intentions, but I was like, this could be a really, um, pivotal moment for someone's career. So I don't know. I was just like, this is where, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be right now. I don't really know why, but it just came, it came naturally. I mean, I definitely spent time, you know, going over the scripts, um, practicing, but for some reason I just retained it really well. Yeah, no, you did. So what was being a contract star like for you and how was it different than what you thought it was going to be? So on the like consumer end, like when you're just watching movies or visiting websites and you're watching like your favorite performers, I was like, like I was obsessed with Jessie Jane back in the day. Like I would watch this documentary and it was her at AVN and she was um, like signing for pirates. And I was like, how amazing, like the costumes and there's CGI and there's all, um, like there's all this acting. And I just, I heard that she was doing like NFL Super Bowl parties, right? Like there was just this stardom that she got to experience. And I thought, well, I'm going to do that if I win this contract. Like I'm going to host these really um, mainstream parties and people are going to be li like lining uh, down the block for my autograph. And I'm going to be on these like really big budget sets. Um, unfortunately, by the time that I was in, like those budgets, as you know, were completely slashed into probably quarters. Mm -hmm. Um, so we weren't getting like the same end product, I think, as her era of porn star got got to um, got to publish. So like that was a little bit disappointing. Um, I also had assumed that there was a lot more freedom, which people would probably laugh at me because like you're signing a contract and it's like 500 pages long. Um, but I thought I was going to be more in charge of like my brand and where I saw myself going and my career and what kind of movies I got to shoot, who I got to work with. Um, and it turns out like there was a lot of budding of heads when it came to that. Like I had a yes list, um, that wasn't taken so nicely from the office. They always wanted me to keep expanding it to the point where it made no sense that it, you would call it a yes list. It would be more like a no list you know, if, you know, they had their way with it. Um, and just like feeling like my boundaries were constantly being pushed and pushed and pushed and not in like the healthiest ways. So I thought of it more, it was going to be like this, um, like a community, right? Like this family and that everyone was in it together and all the directors, um, like got along and all of the staff got along and like, there was just more camaraderie and it just turned out that I just felt like an item to be consumed. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I will say that, uh, my geek has actually changed a lot since then because I've been working for them forever. And, uh, the new people that are there, I don't know what it is. They've like changed. I, I always joke that they had some kind of, um, like, uh, I don't know, you know, those people that come in and they kind of like, 
you have like this leadership building exercise and they mm-hmm. like teach you how to, I don't know, be, be a better corporation. I, I swear they did something like that because they're so different now. They they take oh, into account so much. Their contract stars, yeses and nos. They ask them like what they want to shoot, what looks they want to do. Um, they treat me so well. Uh, they gave me a raise without even asking for it. They like tell me how much they value me all the time. So it's like, it's so, it's, it's a totally different place now. It's interesting. Well, that's good to hear for sure. Yeah. 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 But, um, yeah, it was, it was really, uh, it was a lot and digital playground, you know, with the, with the features and everything, it's just, it's a lot. It's, it's trying to fulfill all of those requests on, you know, a limited budget is, is tricky. And, you know, you talked about Jesse Jane and pirates. I just remember at the time that was like the most expensive porn movie that had been ever been made. I think it was like $10 million at the end of the day, which includes also all the promotion and stuff. So that wasn't just the budget for putting the movie together, but, um, but they, then they ended up having like a special, um, R rated cut in blockbuster. I don't know if you ever saw that version, No. but it was actually kind of hilarious because they had to cut out so much sexy stuff that like actually didn't make any sense. There'd be like big, like holes in the story, <laughs> but I mean, it did really well. Wow. But yeah, it yeah, was, that uh, was, that was what I thought I was going to be able to experience. Um, so now you are only working for yourself. You're yes. not shooting for any brands. Um, how is, how is your life different now in that way? Oh my gosh. In every way possible. It's like, it's done a complete 180. Um, so I've been self-producing now for, I want to say like four years. Like I haven't been keeping, um, super close track. Uh, my like Tushy showcase was one of the last big projects that I did before I stopped shooting mainstream. Um, it's insane the amount of time I have now to be able to like work on anything else that kind of like feeds my soul, like other than um, just shooting all the time and trying to keep up with that like endless supply of content that's that's needed. Um, I was sh- I was basically living in California and then visiting my home because I was shooting so much and everything just felt so out of balance. I was like, what is this all for if I don't have a life outside of the industry? And I wasn't one of those girls that that like thrived in that situation. Like I didn't like going out to the clubs all the time. I didn't like the drama. Like I liked my civilian friends and I wanted to spend time with like my, you know, then fiance and now husband and just like have some semblance of a normal life. So when I started self-producing, it was like I can just block out a certain amount of time during the week, knock out all of my content that day for that'll hold me over for, you know, like two months or something like that. And then if everything, like you have all of your systems and processes in order, everything's just uploading on its own. So now you have all of this time. And then I think the biggest mind fuck was seeing how much money there was to be made. So it was like constantly being told that I was overvaluing myself at whatever my shoot price was and like how it was kind of absurd that I thought I should get X for a day. Like that was always an argument. Even when I was contracted, like I wanted a raise or I wanted more for something and I would try to justify it. And there's like, there's no money being made in porn. And then you launch your own company or you launch your own website or now it's like OnlyFans. You're like, holy shit, that's not, that's not true at all. That's not true at all. So I think it, um, it gave me a, I guess, broader perspective as to like what my brand was worth. Um, And that, like, if I guess being my authentic self and like producing the content that I actually find like fun and playful and sexy does well, and you don't have to do these extreme acts and try to keep up with everybody, you can be yourself and still make a profit, still have a successful brand, and then still have balance in your life. Yeah. I mean, you know, we talk about this so much on the podcast, but it's just like there's no way around it. These personal content platforms have completely changed everything. Because before, you know, I knew a lot of models that, you know, had their own solo sites and they'd, you know, shoot for it, but they still like wouldn't make anything close to what people are making on OnlyFans now. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it just, I think a lot of it is the way that it's structured. You know, you have like the membership fee and then you have the additional money that you pay for like bonus content, um, you know, tipping to, you know, have these long lengthy 
um, conversations with girls via DM. And it just, for me, it really shows that what the fans kind of wanted this whole time was a more personal and direct connection with the girls that, Mm -hmm. that they loved, you know, Mm -hmm. it's great. These beautiful glamorous shoots and, you know, high expensive videos and stuff like that, but there, there was no attainability in that. And so now, you know, girls are making so much money shooting stuff on their cell phone in their bedroom, <laughs> <laughs> you know, after we spent like thousands of dollars and hours trying to put together like something really big and like fancy. And then it's like the cell phone content that's selling, but it's really all about about that, that direct connection with the fans, you know, and, and them feeling like they're supporting you directly. I think that that's, that's what the huge change has been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you hear a lot of stories of girls that didn't have the best experience in porn. Um, and like that goes around, right. People hear that. So they want to kind of know that the content that they're consuming is ethical on some level, like the Mm -hmm. girl's willing and excited to be there and that they're not going to hear some story about her having a really bad day on set or her being kind of strong armed into doing something she didn't want. So I think that there's, um, a little less guilt too on the consumer end because like you just know that it's like a safe environment. If you're signing up for like an individual's um, only fans. I can't really speak to because I know some companies are doing it as well or um, just like broader brands. But when you're signing up for like an individual, you kind of are assured that it's ethical content. Yeah. I get a lot of people writing to me saying, you know, Hey, I want to support these performers. Um, you know, what's like the best ethical companies to, um, invest in. Cause you know, some people do want like the high budget, mm-hmm videos. Some people don't want the cell phone videos, but I I will say that another thing that OnlyFans has done is I think it's made brands realize how incredibly important performers are. And now that performers have so much more autonomy, you know, they can just be like, fuck you. And I think a lot of brands have now taken that into account, like, oh shit, like we have to make sure that we treat these people well, otherwise they're just not going to shoot for us. You know, I mean, it's already hard sometimes to get girls to show up to set because, you know, like they're doing fine on their own. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's created a better shooting environment for everybody. And I've noticed that even the brands have really kind of changed the way that they approach everything, which I think is really, really healthy. Mm-hmm. So, so um, do you see them changing like the payment structure at all? Like, mo- like in the future, as far as mainstream companies, like, do you see royalties becoming a thing, or do you think um, that's still a pipe dream? That's a good question. Um, I, I know that there was some talk at Gamma about royalties. I don't know if that's happened. I do know that with Adult Time, I have a channel on Adult Time, and I get paid per view. So that's kind of like royalties. And on Pornhub, if you put up videos, you get paid per view as well. So sort of, but when you shoot for um, them directly, not really. I don't know. I know for me, like if I tried to pay royalties on content that I shot of people, it would be really hard to track, you know, because so you could I'd do ha- it like an. You could do it like an NFT though, right? Like, so the original piece of content would be structured like an NFT. Yeah. And then there's like no guesswork as far as like what you owe the original performer. Right, right. Yeah. Those, I mean, these are all structures that, you know, a lot of us don't have in place and I think are kind of new, Mm -hmm. but it's definitely a possibility down the line for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, you know, brands are going to go whatever way they have to go in order to, you know, keep being able to, to shoot the girls that they want to. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say that I've definitely noticed that contract girls rates have gone up because, you know, I, I pay them, um, mm-hmm. the company pays me and I pay them. So I've definitely noticed that rates have, have gone up for sure. So that's good. That's good. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about Eva's new life as a mom. So hang tight. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. 
Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Hello, everybody. We are back. So Eva, you are a mom. Um, and I, I can also put myself in that category, which is, which is pretty cool. So how has motherhood changed you as a person? Oh my gosh. It was like, I don't know if it's the same for you or not, but there was the me before I gave birth. And then there was the me afterwards. Like there's a very definitive moment of like transcendence. Like you're just, now you're existing on a completely different level and it's, I think like it opened me up a lot more emotionally. Like my ability to love has just expanded like to a place where I didn't know was possible. I always thought like I loved my husband or I loved my family or my friends. But then when you have this little person that you created, you're like, holy, this is like, this is another thing. Like there needs to be another name for this, this kind of feeling that I'm having. Um, I think also I'm just like hyper focused on I would just like for a lack of better words like it's super trendy right now and it's going to sound crunchy but like conscious parenting right so every little thing that I'm doing you know up until year seven is creating that inner voice for him and like what he's going to constantly tell himself and the rules of the world, you know, according to how we raise him. So is that going to be like a positive tone? Is that going to be really pessimistic? And like, that's a huge freaking responsibility. So um, we're also at that point where, so he's a year and a half where we're approaching like that first memory territory, right? So what's his first memory going to be? Like, I, like I'm responsible for that. Like me and my husband, is it going to be a positive one or is it going to be a negative one? Um so like there's just like a lot of pressure with that. And I think just more awareness of just how I'm behaving, how I'm thinking, um, and just trying to like make his life the best that it can be. Yeah. No, I totally hear you on that. It's funny, my husband and I, because Violet's eight months and we keep telling ourselves and my parents too, because I, I moved in with my parents recently and we all swear a lot. <laughs> And we're like, we've got to like stop swearing all the time because we don't want our baby's first word to be fuck. Like, even though that'd be kind of <laughs> hilarious, um, probably not a good thing. And, and yeah, and actually one of the things that we're kind of struggling with right now, she's going through a sleep regression. As I was telling you before we started. So, you know, she woke up at midnight, she woke up at 3am, she woke up at 5.30. Um, it's like, you know, some parents let the babies cry it out. And I don't want to do that because part of me feels like, what if that feeds into this thinking pattern that's going to start super early that when I need something, I won't have it provided to me, you know, like, I'm, mm -hmm. or, you know, other people might say, oh, well, you know, you're, you're, if you let them cry it out, you're teaching them to self-soothe and be independent. But I'm like, but is it also like teaching them that they're not supported when they need you. Like, I don't know. What, what did you do? Did you let them cry it out or did we you? We cried it out. I like, we, we did cry it out at like five months was when we did the sleep training. I thought I was going to have to lock my husband like in, in the bathroom or in the bedroom because he's like, I have to go. We, it was very opposite. He's like, I have to go get him. And I was like, you will stay put. We are doing this. 
um, when he was like at his worst with the sleep regression, it was every hour on the hour. And I was like, Ugh. I cannot function. So we hired someone and we, it took almost, um, two weeks. Like he was resilient. Um, but I was like, I leaned more in the camp of it teaches you independence and self-soothing and all of that. Um, there's this interesting book called Attached. Let me see if I I know it's behind me somewhere, Um, but it's on parenting and attachment styles. So according to the data, it's that if you meet your child's needs, not wants, but needs like diaper, food, um, like sleep, all of that, one out of every three times you're like you're in a good place, you're in a good position. So that made me feel a lot better because I felt like I had to make meet every want, let alone every need. Um, cause I'm like, well, I don't want a kid the same thing that doesn't think that they, they're, they're supported or that they're unconditionally loved or that they're safe. Cause that's obviously really important too. So it's like, well, where's the line? Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely what I'm, what I'm struggling with right now. Mm-hmm. Um, how has becoming a mom, has it made you look at the adult industry differently and like your career differently? So I think it's made me reflect a lot more on it, if anything, just to really understand like the different facets and the potential impacts and um, potential consequences that could have on like individuals. And like, even if you want to scope out to the societal level, I've always been pretty anti um, like free porn. Like I've always thought a paywall is just seems like the most ethical way to approach porn, especially mm-hmm. with the content that's kind of out there now. And then after, I don't know I've talked to a lot of um, like clinical psychologists and evolutionary biologists. Like I've had the pleasure of talking to like a lot of experts on on my show, and they kind of express um, the potential risks of consuming content too young without context. So obviously, yeah, that is the parent's responsibility to get there before their friend puts them on a, on a tube site, right? And it's like, let's mm-hmm. browse this. Like, it's your job as the parent to to prepare them for the world. So it's not to take away from that, but it it is telling, like, should I be able to just go on a site and see some pretty violent material without context, right? And without age verification um, and without knowing if that person was of age or if they were consenting, because some of it's like really convincing. So mm-hmm. I think establishing a paywall is like a first step, right? Like at least we know that the person's old enough to have a credit card. Obviously, there's workarounds and nothing is 100% um, foolproof. But to me, like that's one thing that I kind of um, got more passionate about after becoming a mom because I'm like, well, I don't want some – you know, douchey kid when he's 10 years old on his smartphone and like showing my kid all this stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, like that's not preventable. So we just have to prepare him for that situation. Um, So yeah, that I'm not too crazy about. Um, Like all my socials, even on Twitter where it's allowed, like I made sure I removed like all explicit stuff because I don't want to be like a hypocrite. So I just scroll through like years and years of stuff of me retweeting (laughs) other companies. I was like, ooh, I used to think that was no big deal because I was just like shamelessly promoting myself. And now I I look at it from like an impact that it could potentially have on other people. Um, Yeah, I would say that's probably the biggest one. I mean, I'm still like very pro, you know like sex work and pro pornography and like I think sex is a beautiful thing between consenting adults and I think unfortunately we instill too much shame around it as a society and like that's not what I want to teach my son right is I want to teach him that between consenting adults that sex is supposed to be fun and it can be love it doesn't necessarily have to be love um you know, just like having him be a little bit more open minded and like come to his own conclusion. If he ends up being a little bit more conservative on the topic, then that's fine. Like, I'm not going to push my will onto him, but to just present it in a different way. Mm-hmm. Do you worry about how you're going to tell him what you do for a living? I don't really know exactly the way to go about it. Like, we talk about it all of the time. It's super important to both my husband and I that we're the first person to break that news to him. Like, it's not going to be anybody else. Um, So I think that's going to take just a lot of vigilance to see, like, who he's hanging out with and where they seem to be on as far as, um, like, an emotional level. Like, do I have a gut feeling that maybe like they're looking at some magazines or that, you know, maybe one of the kids has access to the internet unsupervised, like just being aware of that. Um, and then prior just dropping like little seeds, like maybe it starts with, you know, 
mommy's a model and starting with Mm -hmm. that mommy's you know kind of famous and as he gets a little bit older and again age appropriate break that news to him like so maybe it starts with you know or is in the middle where you know mommy was naked on um online and how do you feel about that and you know let him explore those feelings until we break the news that it's a little bit more than just being naked um And then I, I think it's super important, too, to just, like, be okay with however he reacts to that, right? It's like, right. I can't predict it. I can't predict it at all right now. Um, I hope that it goes smoothly, but I always say I think the benefit is is that it's it's a potential train wreck that I can see coming. And I think mm-hmm. how rare is that in parenting that we know, like, a very obvious, like, pain point. So it, at least I can prepare for it, whereas I can't predict anything else. I can't predict if he gets bullied for whatever reason. I can't predict if he becomes a bully. Like, how do you handle these things? Um, so I think it's actually a little bit more of an advantage than other parts of parenting. Yeah. I actually just um, interviewed two guests back to back who are both moms and we talked about um, sex work and parenting and Jet Set Jasmine was my, was my last guest and, and she just talked to, and she's also a therapist too. And she just talked about it being like an evolving conversation that, you know, because obviously like when they're really young, like you can't just lay it all on the table. Right. It's gotta be, you know, age appropriate as, as they get older. Um, but she's, you know, successful. She, I think she's got three kids. Um, and the oldest one is 20 and, you know, is fully aware of what she does and is, is very comfortable with it. And then, uh, Savannah Sampson, who was a vivid girl, had a really sweet story about her son. And, um, you know, he's also older now, like 20 or something like that. And he came into, I think, her office and she had a bunch of her awards, you know, like AVN awards up, but she had like turned them, you know, because the label says like best all girl sex scene, best gangbang, you know, like these words that she didn't really want him to see. And I guess there was this moment where he kind of was like, no, mom, like you should be proud of these awards. Like you worked really hard for this. And he like goes and he like turns each award one by one and like reads it off. And he's like, you know, best all girl sex scene, go mom. And it was just like (laughs) this, this, it was a really sweet story. And it was, you know, obviously this pivotal moment where, you know, she saw that her son was okay with what she did for a living and he accepted and so loved her. Mm -hmm. And from my own perspective, you know, being raised by parents who, you know, shot porn, um, people always ask me, you know, what's that pivotal moment that you found out, that epiphany that you had? And and I never had that. I don't remember like finding out. I think same thing for them. It was kind of this evolving conversation. At the beginning, it was, you know, mommy and daddy make like movies for grownups and you're not a grownup. So this is not something that like you look at. And I, I don't know. I just like mm-hmm. eventually knew and it was never anything that was a big deal. You know, I think that if you raise your children with love and support and compassion and your children feel safe and they feel loved and they feel supported, like Mm -hmm. what you do for a living is not, I don't think it's as important as people think it is. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that we're also moving into, I hope that we're moving into a culture where sex work is more accepted you know, I mean, obviously there's setbacks and there's, you know, people who have it out for us and, you know, this, this comes up all the time, but I feel like overall, um, we're starting to see that the younger generation is becoming more accepting of people in sex work and is starting to acknowledge that, you know, it's a legitimate job and that the people in the industry are some of the most wonderful people, you know, I've, I've ever met. We're not deviants. We're not criminals. We're not, you know, broken or damaged. So I'm hoping that, that, that will be a more accepting culture will be the kind of culture that our kids grow up in. So it won't be such a big issue when it comes to the time that we have to like talk about what we do. No, I totally agree. And I also think that like the rising of other like third party platforms and girls kind of being in charge of their own content, it's like a totally different narrative. So I was trying to talk to someone, um, like a really religious person about this the other day. And he had just realized what I had, what I do for a living. Um, and we're like partnering on this project together. And he's like, well, was it a situation that you felt like you were being exploited and then like you got out and you're done and like that he so badly wanted that to be the answer. And I was like, Mm -hmm. no, like 
it was a very conscious decision on my end. It was a career. Like I'm still doing it. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think there's a big difference between someone who's being exploited and someone who's not. Um, and in my experience, like if you're consciously um, consenting to anything, like you can't be degraded and you can't be exploited because you're aware of exactly what you're partaking in. Right. And it's like that changes. Like if the moment I say like, no, I don't want to do that. And then you continue to do that. That's a different story. Um, but that's not what it is. And again, like when you're producing for yourself, I think there's a lot more transparency with that. And it's a lot harder to have that narrative of like these poor girls because it's like, no, I'm a badass and I'm a businesswoman and I'm doing this all on my own. Like I'm I'm consciously making this decision. Um, so you can't tell that story for me and maybe you're projecting like your own insecurity about this and like your own discomfort when it comes to sexuality but that's like not my stuff that's your stuff yeah I mean one of the things that makes me kind of the most crazy about the whole idea that you know all women in porn are exploited and it's degrading to women is just like when you say that you automatically place the woman in the role of the victim right mm -hmm. and you're automatically suggesting that she has no agency over her career that she ha doesn't have the strength to stand up for herself that she couldn't possibly actually be a sexual person um that this must all be pushed on her because women aren't sexual women aren't exhibitionists women don't know what they're getting into. Women don't know how to say no. Women don't know how to set boundaries. So um, I find that intensely frustrating. So uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think that this new era that we're moving into where you know people have more control over their careers is just um, creating a better environment overall. Mm -hmm. um, so as a mother, do you find that you struggle at all with being a mom and a sex symbol, or do you think that you can do both? I know you can do both. I, I always find it so fascinating that it's like, as soon as you become a mom, like you're no longer supposed to be your own person. You're not allowed to have your own wants or your own desires and heaven forbid that you're sexual, but it's like, what, what action took place to create this beautiful little thing, right? Like that was, that was sex. Like they're, they, they exist together. And even on like a spiritual level, when you talk about like the energy of sex, like that's the energy of creation, right? Like creation and creativity. Um, and I don't understand how we, I don't know, have such a problem with them coexisting, right? Because it's the same thing. Um, I think for you to be like a happy, functioning, well-rounded person, especially if you're you're married, you have to let that part of you live and thrive even, right? Like that's such a quintessential part to having that healthy dynamic is maintaining that spark. Like I don't want a roommate. Like I want like a passionate love affair with my husband until we're old and one of us can't have sex anymore, right? Like <laughs> I think that's so, so beautiful and so important. And um, when it comes to – like having a well-adjusted child, I mean, all of the research even suggests that them seeing affection displayed between their parents, like physical affection. And obviously, again, like there's always going to be someone like kissing, right? We're not go yeah. going at it in front of the kid. Yeah. Um, yes. But like loving affection actually makes them more in tune with their emotions and makes them have healthier romantic relationships down the line. So I think when you try to say, okay, I had a kid and I need to just like button up and let that part of me die. I think it's not only going to be detrimental to you and your marriage, but you're also doing your child a huge disservice. Um, mm -hmm. And then I know some men, I guess, too, like especially if they're there for the birth, that there is a problem with them, I guess, like seeing their wife as a sexual ob object before. And it's like you kind of have to learn to compartmentalize, right? Like the same person that just gave birth or is that that's like giving your kid a bath is not the person that you're taking out on a date and it's not the person that you're being intimate with in your bedroom so I think you have to be able to like define those roles and put those in like certain buckets and you know and separate that um and I I don't know I mean like you just have to figure out how to reframe that because I know some people some men think it's like traumatic when witnessing the birth but like reframe that like your wife just did something freaking incredible and something so beautiful and she just created like perfection right like there is nothing more beautiful than creating a human life so just like trying to figure out what story you can tell yourself that makes you appreciate that moment instead of um it like ruining the way that you see your your spouse it's funny that you say that because 
when I gave birth, my husband was, was all about like, he's like, I'm not going to look down there. I'm just going to be there, you know, but my labor actually ended up being really fast and the baby came out really like before the doctors expected it. Wow. And so like, he actually like looked down there because I, I remember they had given me the epidural and they were just kind of like moseying about, you know, and I was like, babe, I don't know, man. I feel like she's coming faster than they think. And he like looked down there and saw like her started to come out. And so, and then he was like, oh my God, the baby's coming. And then they all rushed to, to deliver her. But like, it was something that he didn't intend. And then uh-huh. he was like, yeah, it's like, I didn't want to see that. He's like, I don't know if I'm going to go down there for a little while. Oh, wow. <laughs> see, mine was the opposite. So he, like, even before he's like, I want to watch, I want to see the whole thing. Like I'm there. Um, I was in labor for like over 70 hours though. So very oh. different story. Um, but in like the process, like he was down there with the nurses, like he was ready to catch the baby. And he's like, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He did say, um, what was amazing was, and I'm sure your husband probably saw the same thing. And I actually didn't really know that this happened, but you know, the, the skull of the baby is, is, is plates that haven't fused together yet. So, um, they kind of overlap each other so that it can get through the birth canal. And he said that he saw, her head come out like with the plates overlapping and then literally just popped into place. Like the skull Ooh. just popped into place. And oh, he's like, it's the crazy. craziest thing I've ever seen. Oh man. Yeah. I'll I have know. to ask him. Yeah. Ask him if he saw that because that's, that's, I guess what happens. And uh, that, that really tripped him out. It was, <laughs> but yeah, it was a, it was a crazy, crazy experience. I mean, wow. All right, guys, uh, we're going to take one more commercial break and then we're going to come back and talk about Eva's podcast, Chatting with Candace, and so much more. So hang tight. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is like the biggest online sex toy retail store. And in fact, they don't just offer sex toys. They also have movies, they have lingerie. They basically have anything sexy that you could be looking for. Now they have an incredible offer. Get 50% off of any one item when you go to adamandeve.com. But that's not where it ends. So not only will you get 50% off any one item, they will also load up 10 free gifts for you on top of that. You will get six free movies, a free mystery pack that includes an item for him and a special toy for her and something we know you'll both enjoy, plus free shipping. Now that's a lot of free stuff, but you can only get this offer if you go to adamandeve.com and use my code HOLLY. That's adameve.com. Use code HOLLY for 50% off of any one item plus 10 free gifts. And we're back. So you spoke earlier about, you know, now that you're shooting just for yourself, how much more time that you have to explore other things. And I know that one of the new endeavors that you've embarked on is starting your own podcast. So tell me a little bit about your podcast, the kinds of guests that you have on, does it have a theme and, um, how maybe it's like changed your view on the world. Cause I know that my podcast is, has, I feel like has made me a different person actually in a lot of ways. And I'm just wondering if your experience is the same thing. Yeah. So I started the podcast a little less than a year ago. Um, It was during quarantine. I think everyone started a podcast. It's like, what do I do at this time? Um, I wanted, I guess like my main mission statement for the podcast or like the reason that I started it was I wanted to like humanize controversial people and controversial topics. I wanted people to lean in out of curiosity on conversations that we're not supposed to be having. So it's it's kind of intellectual if you were to ask a theme. Um, I do occasionally have like former or current um, adult performers on. It's not like the main type of guest that I have on. So I have like authors, um, evolutionary psychologists, evolutionary biologists. Um, I actually just had Tom Bilyeu on who is like this really badass entrepreneur. Um, so it's it's people from all walks of life, life, but they tend to specialize in some arena. Uh, it's definitely changed the way I see the world in like in mostly positive ways. I see 
so many people that will write me after an episode, especially if it's with um, like a porn girl, and they're like, I have to be honest and I'm a little bit ashamed to say this, but I always had this idea of what a porn star was. And I always had an idea of what type of person would get into that industry. And then after, you know, spending an hour and a half, two hours with you via podcast, like you turned my like my life, my life view upside down. And like I want to thank you for that. And to me, that's so incredible. And like if I can do that just like a couple people a week, how amazing is that? Right. Like I think to challenge people's long held beliefs is ama- is like really an amazing experience and to be in that position. Um, I still don't know how I ended up there, but it's it's really incredible. And then also when I I tackle topics that people like say not to have, like I do um, like sex and gender is one that I've had a couple of times. Right. And like no one wants to go there. Uh, you see people are a lot more open minded, I think, than you give them credit for. And like people you would assume are just going to cancel you or whatever it is. Um and I very rarely get that negative hate mail or negative YouTube comments. So I think um, it's showing me like a different side of social media as well. Like it's not always this like toxic environment where everyone's trying to go after one another and that people are really craving conversations and um, different different viewpoints, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, since my podcast is is pretty much just about sex, and even though I've also had authors and journalists on, it's always somebody who has some kind of connection to sex in general. It doesn't have to be the adult industry. But yeah, um, a lot of feedback from people who feel that, you know, their minds have been changed about sex workers, which is such such a great um, one, which is the best feedback to have. But I think you're right. I think people, they do want to like see another point of view. Well, not everybody does. Let's be honest. (laughs) But you know, those, those who are curious and those who have a tendency to be more open-minded, I think, I think it's really healthy to listen to, to both sides. And, you know, even if I staunchly believe in one thing, I like to sometimes go and read like the opposite argument because no matter like what we believe in, sometimes we just dig ourselves so deeply in like our trench that, you know, we kind of lie to ourselves, like whatever side you're on, right or left, you know, there's, there's a lot of bullshit on both sides. Right. Um, and I know for, for me, the podcast, my podcast has really challenged, you know, my ideas around gender, around sexuality, around masculinity around femininity. And I feel like it's really opened my eyes and, and just made me a more compassionate, considerate person, um, who can really, I feel like I'm so much better at at understanding how people don't think the way that I think. And that like people can feel completely differently about something and, and that's okay. Like not everybody has to agree with you. I think that's like some, one of our biggest problems is that like, everyone has to agree with, with what you think. And that's not really how humanity works. Like we're made up of a bunch of different ideas and opinions. And that's, you know, I think that's what keeps life interesting and keeps us moving forward. Yeah. That's where innovation happens too. If you have everyone on the same track, like no one's going to question anything. No one's going to learn anything. No one's going to challenge anything. And then how are you supposed to do better? It's like, it's like kind of like wine, right? So when you're trying to make like a really good wine, like the best wines, the most expensive wines have to go through stress. Like you actually have to stress the grape. So you stress it with temperature um, or you stress it with um, like depriving it of oxygen. So different climates, right? If you have the perfect environment and you give that grape everything that it wants, it's going to be like fruit juice. No one wants that. So I think people are very much the same. I think that um, you kind of have to lean into adversity and like lean in to people challenging you. And then that's when everyone can kind of grow to be the best version of themselves. Yeah. I mean, you, you could say the same thing. I've heard that same analogy with diamonds. You know, diamonds are created by by pressure, by stress. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's along the same lines. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you from my Patreon members. Okay. Um, so the first one is from Jabberwock, uh, TSC. Um, he said, what do you do once you arrive on set to get ready for the sex portion of the filming? Um, 
I would say when when I was shooting for companies and I still was going on sets, um, if it was regular sex, there wasn't like a lot of prep. So just like obviously making sure that you're showered and you're trimmed down there and everything like, you know, is clean and shiny and looks good. Um, for me, I always had a yes list. So I think for people that don't like having an established chemistry, like talking to the person before, I remember I was on one of your sets and (laughs) they were talking about one of the male talents that was on, he was on my yes list, but I hadn't worked with him yet. And they were like, oh, well, just so you know, like last time he was on one of Holly's sets, he told one of the girls, like, don't talk to me before the scene. (laughs) Like, I don't want to, I don't want to interact with the female talent before the scene. I was like, oh, well, today's going to be a great day. (laughs) Um, How did the scene turn out? It ended up being good. He ended up coming into the makeup room and he was engaging with me the whole time. So I was like, I don't know, maybe it was like, he just didn't really like the girl that he was on set with because that was not what I experienced. Um, But if that had actually happened, I would probably imagine it would have been a terrible scene. And then it was very obvious that I was just waiting to get done. But yeah, yeah you know, establishing it's, a connection on some level. It's interesting because everybody has different preferences. I definitely know that there are some girls who are like, I don't want to talk to you before the scene. Like, don't come bother me in the makeup room. Like, but I think those are people who prefer, who are kind of just in and out for the buck, don't really want to make a connection. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just want to perform and, and get out. But everyone's got their own preferences. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is from Jacob. He says, how has working in the industry changed your personal sex life? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so I'd say in the beginning, it kind of created like an unrealistic expectation. And then that actually was like hurting my sex life for a while because I was like, well, it's supposed to be this all the time, right? I was doing these really intense scenes with tons of energy and Um, like passion, whether or not it was real, right? It was still like happening for me in that experience. It was like still this like visceral exchange that you could have. Um, So I was like, well, if it's not that, then it's boring and I don't want that. And then I also um, started to get to a place where I like wasn't connecting during sex. So it took me actually getting out of shooting mainstream to kind of tackle that and be like, whoa, like that's those are two different things. Like there's this kind of sex that's for entertainment. And then there's like a love and connection kind of sex, which can still also be dirty, obviously, right? Like it doesn't have to be like romantic all the time, but it's, it's that connecting. So after I got out of mainstream, I had to like really work on that with my husband and like reconnect almost and like redefine what sex was and that um, like it's something for him and I to be experiencing together and I don't have to be putting on a performance all of the time and I don't have to worry if I look good and I don't have to worry if I sound good. Um, cause you almost get like robotic, right? Like it's almost, it becomes like a reflex because you're, you're, that's what you're doing all of the time. And you just had a, I kind of had a hit reset. Um, so for me, it just made me work on it more and just be more aware of it. Um, so now our sex life is great, but for a moment it was, um, there was a lot of overlap and not necessarily in a beneficial way. It's funny. You just reminded me about when uh, there's been a couple of times that I've shot like a brand new girl who, you know, was probably naturally like quiet in bed, but you know, had to put on a performance for the scene. And I remember this one girl asked me, she's like, what do I say? She's like, I don't know what to say. And I'm like, just talk about what's happening to you. (laughs) So be like, oh my God, your dick's in my pussy. Like, oh my God, your tongue's in my pussy. Like, cause I was like, I don't know. Like, what do you want me to hold up cards and be like, <laughs> like, just, just kind of like, just, um, articulate what's happening to you in the moment. And I guess that'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't really talk a lot during my scenes. I wasn't like a big dirty talker. Um, it just like, wasn't something that felt natural. Like I made noise mm-hmm. obviously, but I wasn't, yeah. um, like I wasn't that good at finding the dialogue. I just, and I remember with some sets, they would have specific things that they wanted you to say. And it's like, I'm losing my flow of the moment Mm -hmm. because I have to stop, break, hear what you're saying and then relay it. So in that moment, that's just way too many pieces going on. So I'm sure Mm -hmm. my performance probably was sacrificed on those particular days. Um, But yeah, it's weird because it's like at one point you want to be yourself 
on camera because I think that's really important. But it almost has to be like a bumped up version of you because if it was exactly how you had sex in real life, like no one's going to watch that. So it's like how do I remain myself but also stay entertaining? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, in the end, at the end of the day, it's a performance for entertainment. So mm-hmm. I think for some people, it's probably very authentic and and possibly exactly like how they have sex at home. But I think for a lot of people, it's not like that at all. Mm-hmm. So what advice would you give to a new girl looking to come into the industry? What are some of the things that maybe you wished you had known when you first got in? Oh, man. Um So I was like, I was pretty fortunate. I, when I came up with my name, I wanted something that didn't exist. And that's been like both beneficial and also annoying at some parts because a lot of people can't pronounce my names. I'm like, I wish I picked something a little bit easier. Um, But I trademarked my name right away before I started shooting. So I think that's super important. Um, I think buying your own domain is also crucial. So I fell into the trap of a lot of um, a lot of performers and like novice ones where I signed up with a uh, webmaster and then they're like, I'll buy the domain for you. It's not a big deal. And here, just sign this piece of paper. And then before you know it, you're signing away all of your rights to everything and they're banking on you being successful and then selling that or not giving you a piece down the line. So it actually took me like five years of litigation to get my domain back um, and to get the site taken down. So that would have saved me a lot of time, headache and money had I done that. So never give away your name, never give away your domain, never sign anything that says in perpetuity, which is not supposed to be legal anyways, but people still try to sneak that in there. Um, And then I think always like stay true to what you want to do. And it's really hard when you start getting money thrown at you that you're not used to. It's like you can easily um, find that slippery of sl- slippery slope of like what you're okay with and what like your own like moral compass is where you're like your own threshold of, you know, intensity um, because that money goes away so quick. Like you can spend that money so fast. And then at the end of the day, you have to be okay with the content that you put out there because it's forever. Right. It's like that is, yeah, it might get get thrown down the pipelines 20 years from now. There's always going to be newer girls that are piling on top of that. But if they Google your name, like that's a forever thing. And you don't want something out there that you're like, that was a terrible day. And every time you see it, you're like reminded of a decision you made that was against like your own code. Um, Mm -hmm. So like never do anything for the money. Um, And I think have like an exit plan, like figure what figure out what that is. Because like a lot of things that require your body, whether you're an athlete or a mainstream performer or um, an adult performer, like there's just a, there's a shelf life. So you just have to kind of prepare for, for after the fact. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, I think one thing that I was talking about this the other day with my brother about how incredibly frustrating it is that um, one of the classes in high school that you don't get that I think everybody should get is like finance, Mm -hmm. taxes, and, um, learning how to like, you know, set up an IRA, um, put money aside for retirement. I mean, it's crazy how many people don't know about that kind of stuff. I was having a conversation with a performer the other day about taxes and like, they didn't really understand like how that worked and like why taxes were being taken out. And, um, and I was like, this is something that everybody should be taught in high school. Like, why are we taking home ec classes? Like, who gives a shit if you know how to fucking make a pie or whatever they teach you in home ec? I don't know. I never took home ec. But, like, financial. <laughs> That's exactly what they teach you in home ec. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, like, but, you know, financial um, responsibility, um, understanding how to, you know, run a small business, understanding tax codes, like, it makes me insane. Yeah. And it's, it's really sad because unfortunately I think that's like, that's the majority and like the minority is the girls that have it figured out financially. So many girls, even like top name girls, you would be shocked where are like, they're still paying off taxes from like three years ago. Yeah. No, I get notices. Like if you don't pay your taxes and I've paid you at one point, the IRS sends me a letter. So I know exactly who's not paying their taxes. And it, it, the names are sometimes really surprising to me. I'm like, I thought so you what's, together. What's crazy is there's like, so with OnlyFans, 
I always like have like a bone to pick because I feel like it is the agency's duty, especially when they sign a girl that they know is young and dumb to like let them know that. Right. Like Mm -hmm. it takes zero effort to say, hey, you might want to retain at least 30 percent for taxes, give or take. Right. And then if they want to elaborate more, they can or they can send them in the direction of like a, a, a decent accountant. But like at least like you're already having them sign paperwork anyways to be a part of the agency. So just like having that be part of the onboarding process. So that mm-hmm. always annoys me that no one takes um like gives a shit in that regard. Um but with OnlyFans, it's like you have girls signing it uh signing up that have never been in the industry so they don't have anyone else to talk to. Like at least with porn, you're on set with other performers and you can kind of like share information. With OnlyFans, you're shooting at your house, you're not really meeting anyone. Like what is the likelihood that you meet another like performer content creator. And now you have these other agencies that are even more sketch than porn agencies because you're not meeting the person half the time. So you don't know um, what their intentions are, what they're doing with your content. There's this girl in my town. So I, I live in North Carolina, like small town, and she's making like solid six figures a month on her OnlyFans. And she's super young. So obviously not being smart with money. Um, signed up with this agency that's taking half. So they're taking 50%. OnlyFans obviously takes their 20%. So now we're already at 70%. Spending all of whatever she is taking home on like the boy of the minute or the friends of the minute. Definitely not saving. And I was like, someone needs to talk to her because come April, she's going to get rocked. And that's like not – like not a loophole you want to be in or a cycle that you want to get involved in, right? It's like once you owe taxes, it's a very dangerous game to play. Um, there's like how do you how do you fix that problem, right? It's like you need you need mentors. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but for some reason, like women are the meanest to each other. Like we don't want to help each other. And for some reason, there's such a limited mindset when it comes to success. It's like, well, if I, if she's doing well, then that's gonna hurt my prosperity. It's like, no, we can all thrive together. Like porn is a multi-billion dollar industry. She can make a ton of money. I can make a ton of money. And if I know something that she doesn't know, like for me personally, I'm, I try to like scream, don't make that mistake and hopefully yeah. you hear it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I haven't really experienced that. I think just because I've always been on the other side of the camera. So mm-hmm. girls don't feel competitive with me because I'm not their competitor, but I've heard that from other girls for sure, especially new girls, mm-hmm. you know, that they like don't have anybody to talk to and you know, anyone to give them advice. I always thought that we should like start like a big sister, like project or program for, mm-hmm. for porn, because there's, there's a lot of girls out there who, you know, don't know. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I've always like thought about kind of doing like a porn 101 book, but I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon. I have so many things on my plate, but I I think it would be a really great idea. The problem is, is that not everybody wants to read it. Right. So, you know, there's only so much you can do. You mm-hmm. can offer somebody advice, but not everybody wants to, wants to take it. Yeah. It's and, the old um, leading a horse to water analogy. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I was lucky in the sense, like before I started my business that I started working for my parents and I kind of like saw, you know, how they structured things. And then I actually got a really great accountant who set me up with my corporation, set me up with QuickBooks and set me up with like, like I, my books are so clean and I'm so on it with those, but because I had like the perfect setup from the start and I have Mm -hmm. everything categorized and I balance my books every single day. And so actually like, you know, keeping track of my finances has been really easy for me, but I know it's a real mess if you come in, like, you know, having not done that from the start. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say, um, the first thing is like, get an accountant, get like a QuickBooks program or or something, some kind of program that will help you track your finances and just start from day one, like just track that shit. Because if you like leave it to like two, three years down the road and you got to go through a bunch of receipts and figure out what you got to write off and what you can't. It's just such a nightmare. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, Eva slash Candice, thank you so much for coming on. It was such a pleasure to talk to you again. Yeah, you too. Um, Can you tell everybody uh, about your podcast, where they can find it and where they can find you online, whether it's your OnlyFans, your social media, all that stuff? 
Um, so the podcast is Chatting with Candace. Um, it's anywhere that you get podcasts, or you can go to chattingwithcandace.com, and then that has a whole directory for however you want to consume that kind of content. Um, my OnlyFans is uh, onlyfans.com slash evilovia. Um, yeah, and then Instagram, Twitter. Uh, Instagram is Lovia Long Time, and then Twitter is Fallen Lovia. I went through a stupid pun phase, and now I can't change my name because they're both verified. So here we are. I think they're really cute. Thanks. I always thought that was. I thought I've always thought that both were were really lovely. So I don't think it's a bad pun at all. <laughs> And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. If you want to support this show, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.